Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Eduardo Brissino. He's a learner, leader, speaker, writer devoted to a more learning-oriented world. His organization, Mindset, works and helps organizations develop learning-oriented cultures and system. Can we please welcome Mr. Brissino for Mastering the Next Normal, co-founder of Mindset Works. Thank you so much. So uh, that was a great panel. We're going to build on it. And uh, this will be an interactive session. So I'm going to invite you all to take out your mobile devices, uh, your connected devices, and turn them on and put them on silent. We're going to be using them in a little bit. Um, so uh, we heard in the panel, one of the things that we heard is that change is the new normal, right? And faster change. And I just want to check, first of all, can, can everybody get up just to kind of stretch a little bit? Everybody stand up. Great. Feel free to stretch. And let me ask you, in your companies or your industries, which, who of you feel that change is happening? You know, that there's change going on in your companies or industries. Okay, so most of us. And who feels that the rate of change has accelerated? Great. So, so that is part of what we talk about. Uh, and feel free to stand, keep standing up or, or sit down. I just wanted you to stretch a little bit. Um, so that is part of what I think of as the new normal. Now, change has always happened. Change has never stopped, and it never will. But what is different is that the rate of change has accelerated. And also, in today's world, uh, there's a lot more connectivity. So for any one person or company, the world is very vast and very complex. And so what we'll work on in this session is what are some strategies um, and some, some philosophies and some psychological insights that lead us to lead our organizations to master this new normal in this world that is very vast, complex, and fast changing. Uh, so we'll seek to generate insights based on psychology and also generate strategies, leadership strategies, based on those insights. And to do that, I'll ask you to, to take out your devices right now and go to open up a browser and go to this URL. We're going to do a reflection. So go to paulev.com slash works. And when you get there, you're going to see a question that I want you to answer. What you, and again, I'm going to put the URL here, paulev.com slash works. And you see, that, you see the URL here also in the top left. And you'll see a question there. It says, if I could get better at anything, what would I improve? I want you to think about if there's no constraints and you could get better at anything, what would you improve? Let's share our ideas with each other. Mindfulness. Learning discipline, compassion for coworkers, attitude, meditating. If I could get better at anything, what would I improve? Accounting, listening, consistency to work out. Initiative, multitasking, better public speaking, adaptability, interpersonal skills, being open to change and accepting change, value investing, discipline, saying no, my perception of others, collaboration. Now, I want you to start thinking about, for each one of these things, what do you think you could improve on if you worked at it, and which things do you tend to see as fixed in people, as things that you really can't improve on? That's going to be the core of our session today. Because it turns out that if I asked some of you which of these things are fixed in people and can't be improved, and which ones can be improved greatly, we would get different answers from different people. And based on that belief, we behave differently. And we're going to explore that today in more detail. So think about which of these things are relatively fixed in people, in your view, 
and which of these things can be greatly changed. And let's share that with each other. So, what do I tend to assume people can't improve? This is the second question. What are things that I tend to see as fixed in people and people can't improve? What, what is it that you either have it or you don't? What do you think? Attitude, physicality, mindset. And in this question, if you want, you can upvote other people's answers as well. So I, will, I want you to share your ideas, and then you can scroll down, see what other people have submitted, and upvote them if that, if that resonates with you. Listening, so people either are good listeners or bad listeners, and it's hard to become a better listener. Selfishness, not being opinionated. What are the things that are relatively fixed in people, in our view? Great, I'll give you a few more seconds to finish off your thought. Perceptions. Being an empowering leader. Is being an empowering leader that people are either natural at or not? Or is that something that people could become better at, at being an empowering leader? That different belief leads us to behave in very different ways leads us to grow very differently and to achieve different results, and that's what we're going to explore today. So one ability that I think is intriguing in terms of is it fixed or can people become better at um, is the ability to think, because if we see a lot of these things that, that we tend to see as fixed, they tend to be cognitive abilities, our ability to think about different things. They're things that happen in our brain. And so the question is, can we learn to think better and to do all these things better. And so one cognitive ability that can be objectively measured and that I'm intrigued by is the ability to play chess. So chess players, are you can see how good they are very objectively because they play in tournaments and they all have a ranking, a numerical ranking. And so you can see how good a chess player is. And so my question is, can anybody become a great chess player or do these people need something different in their mind to be great chess players? And even more intriguing than chess for me is something called blindfold chess, which is you play a whole game of chess without looking at the board. You keep all the pieces of both players in your mind, and you play, you say, bishop to e7, the other person says, pawn to e6, then you say, rook to d2, and you play the whole game that way. And even more impressive, the grandmasters, and there's, a lot, there's people who can play several games of blindfold chess at the same time. So the first player makes a move, the blindfold person makes a move, the second player makes a move, the blindfold person makes a move, and they play, in some cases, the grandmasters can play 12 or even 20 games of blindfold chess at the same time and beat these masters who are really good chess players. So I just look at these people and think, are these people from this planet or from another planet, right? Is there something that's fixed in them that allows them to do these incredible things? Or is it something that anybody could learn how to think, do these amazing things? So there's somebody who in the 1960s went out to try to answer this question. His name was Laszlo Polgar, and he was from Hungary. And what he did is in his undergraduate studies, he studied the biographies of 400 people who were considered by society to be geniuses, who were fantastic thinkers. And what he concluded is that every single one started their domain, they started their expertise, they started their learning at a very young age. And so he came to believe that he could take any healthy newborn and grow them to be geniuses, to be people who society believed to be geniuses. He thought that genius was made, not something that was fixed and born in people. And so later on, he, he wrote a book about his hypothesis called Bring Up, Bring Up Genius. And then later on, he met a woman by the name of Clara um, who lived in the Ukraine. And he explained to her what he wanted to do. He wanted to take a healthy newborn and grow them to become geniuses. And she became excited about the idea. So she moved to Budapest. They married. And they had three kids. They had three daughters. And at the time, there was, a lot of, there was a, a lot of fixed mindset about chess. So fixed 
mindset is when we see an ability as fixed, something that can't change. And so they said, okay, there's a lot of fixed mindset about chess, and there's a lot of fixed mindset about chess in women, in women in particular, because there had never been a, a grandmaster female chess player before. So they said, we're going to develop these three girls to be geniuses at chess. So that's what they set out to do. And it turns out the three daughters became really, really good at chess. So Susan, who was the oldest, she became the first female grandmaster ever. Uh, the, the, the criteria to become grandmaster is the same for males or females. Uh, Sophia, who was the middle one, she became an international master, which is jo just below grandmaster, between master and grandmaster, still a really, really good chess player. And Judith, who was the youngest, became the best of the three. She became the number eight, play, eight, eight uh, player, male or female. She beat the number one male players in the world, including Magnus Carlsen, who's the number one player right now for six years straight. Uh, Gary Kasparov, who's one of the best players of all time. And she was the number one female player for 25 stri straight years until she retired. Now, her pa their parents didn't have an, any extraordinary IQ, and they weren't great chess players. They learned how to play chess so that they could teach their daughters. Um, and they, they developed these three women uh, to be amazing chess players, and the three of them could play blindfold chess against several, against 12 different masters at the same time. So they developed this idea, this ability, to play blindfold chess in, in parallel with 12 different people. So now, I'm not recommending that you go home and try to replicate this experiment, but I, I, I want to point out that the results of this experiment are very powerful, right? We can develop our cognition, our ability to think, in ways that are much more expansive than we tend to think. Now, uh, so Laszlo and Clara Polgar thought that intelligence could be developed. It's not that there's smart people and not smart people, but they thought that people could become smarter. And that's what we call a growth mindset about intelligence. Someone else who tended to be in a growth mindset about intelligence a lot of the time was Albert Einstein, who I think is an interesting example because we tend to think of him in a fixed mindset. We tend to think this person did all the things he did because he was a genius and that was fixed in him. His intelligence was fixed at a high level. That's how we tend to see him, but that's not at all how he saw himself. He had a lot of growth mindset quotes, like for example, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with a problem longer. So he thought that his ability to think and to solve problems was something that was a result of his process, not something that he was born with. Uh, similarly, he said, I have no special talents, I am only passionately curious. So he thought that intelligence could be developed. Now, this growth mindset or fixed mindset can be applied to any ability. Any of the abilities that we talked about before and that you reflected on, uh, we, could, um, uh, we could think of either as a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. So for example, somebody else who tended to be in a growth mindset a lot of the time uh, was Warren Buffett and his partner, Charlie Munger, who are considered the best in player, investors in the 20th century. So the question for them is, do they see investing as something that is fixed in them, they're geniuses at it, or is that something that they think they can get better at over time? So Charlie Munger says, Warren Buffett has become a lot better as an investor since the day I met him, and so have I. If we had been frozen at any given stage with the knowledge we had, the record would have been much worse than it is, so the game is to keep learning. And Warren Buffett says, I just sit in my office and read all day. Read 500 pages like this every day. That's how knowledge builds up, like compound interest. Clearly people who see their craft as something that they can get better at on a daily basis. Um, and so um, a growth mindset is, is the understanding that we can get better. We can change our human qualities, like for example, empathy. Is empathy something that other people have and, and, and other, some people have and others don't? Or is that something that we can learn and become more empathetic? It's a growth mindset or a fixed mindset about empathy, and that's differentiated from a fixed mindset, which is seeing any of these abilities as fixed in people. And it turns out that when we have each of these different mindsets or beliefs, we behave very differently, and that leads to different results. So when we see qualities and abilities as things that are malleable, it, it leads us to take on more challenges, to do things that we haven't done before. It leads us to seek more help, to see, observe what experts do, to ask for advice, 
give and receive feedback, experiment, do a lot of things to get better. And it also makes us more resilient because when we try something and it doesn't work, we fail or we make a mistake, we understand that's part of the learning process and that's valuable information for us to learn and get better. Um, so we'll, we'll explore this more. This was all developed by Stanford professor Carol Dweck. She was, she was the person who first discovered growth mindsets and fixed mindsets. And she wrote the book called Mindset. If you're interested in learning more after this session, and if you haven't read that book, that's a great resource. And I'll mention another book as well later. Um, so what, what are the benefits of a growth mindset? Um, I, I want to just briefly share a couple of key research studies with you on what the effects of a growth mindset are. And this was uh, first developed with, in, in academics, in schools with kids. And what Dr. Dweck and another one of my partners did, Lisa Blackwell, is they went into schools, and at the beginning of seventh grade, they had kids fill out a multiple choice survey, a simple survey that asked questions like this. Your intelligence is something you can't change very much. And they told the kids, there's no right answer or wrong answer. We just want to learn your perspective. And the kids would agree or disagree or agree strongly or disagree strongly with each of these questions. And the researchers just wanted to measure the mindset that the kids had about intelligence. Did they see intelligence as something that could change? Or was intelligence something that was fixed in people? And what they found is that for the kids who saw intelligence as something that could be developed, the kids who were in a growth mindset, they increased their grades over the next two years, over seventh grade and eighth grade, versus the kids who thought that intelligence couldn't change, um, the, they decreased their grades over the next two years, seventh grade and eighth grade. So then the researchers said, well, that's really powerful. If we, if we teach the kids that intelligence can change and people can get smarter, would, they, would their grades change? Would they start doing better in school? And so they developed a workshop to teach kids neuroscience, and in particular that the brain can change. And there were two versions of the workshop. One was um, neuroscience and teaching that the brain can, is malleable and can physically and functional change. And the other version of the workshop was a control group where the kids just learned neuroscience but not plasticity, not that the brain can change, and they learned effective study skills. But these kids' teachers didn't know that there were two versions of the workshop. They just knew the kids were leaving their classroom to go learn and coming back. And at the end of the workshop, the teachers were asked to identify students who had had a transformational change in motivation in their classroom, who were you know, raising their hands more, taking risks, doing their homework, trying. And the teachers identified three times as many students in the growth mindset condition that learned that the brain can change as in the control group condition. And as a result of that different behavior, the kids started turning around their grades only if they had learned that, that we can change our brain, we can become smarter. Similar study uh, was done in Chile where there's a national achievement uh, test like, uh, that all 10th graders take. And what the Stanford researchers did is they embedded a, a similar survey to the one that I described at the beginning of the test to assess whether kids thought intelligence could change or not. And then what they found is that the kids who thought that people could become smarter were three times more likely to score in the top 20% in both reading and math. And the kids who thought that intelligence was fixed were four times more likely to score in the bottom 20%. Now, there's a lot of research in schools and academics, but there's also been now research done in the workplace. With any particular skill in the workplace, we see the same thing. When we see those skills as malleable, people achieve higher. Like for example, in negotiation skills, when people think that good negotiators are made and negotiation is something that you can learn, these people persevere more in tough negotiations. They find ways to expand the size of the pie, to find win-win find situations, and when they're negotiating with somebody in a fixed mindset, they capture more of the pie. They capture 65% of the pie versus 35% of the pie for somebody in a fixed mindset. Similarly, in management skills, when managers think that people can develop their abilities, when managers are in a growth mindset, uh, first of all, they become better managers because they're trying to become better managers themselves. So they are observing the effect of their, their, their decisions, they're getting feedback from other people, and they're using that information to change and to improve. They also have a more accurate view of the people that they lead. Rather than think of people 
with labels, like this person's an A person and a C person, and that's fixed in them, they, they have a more malleable view of people. So when people change, they have a more accurate perception. And they also become better coaches because they have better information and they're more interested in developing people. So they are more effective in helping the people they lead to improve. And finally, in leadership skills, when people learn that leaders are made rather than born, uh, they experience higher confidence in their own ability to lead, particularly when things are hard, when things are hard and complex. Um, they also experience uh, lower anxiety and depression-like symptoms when they are leading, and they experience higher leadership performance. So think about how often we might tell a young person or a colleague, you're such a natural leader. We're trying to increase their confidence, you know, that they have it in them, but actually the deeper lesson that we're communicating is that you either have it or you don't have it. That's a fixed mindset. And th what happens is that when these people become, go into a challenging situation and they struggle, they conclude, I must not be a natural leader after all. I must ha not have it in me. And then they disengage, their confidence drops. And so rather than talk about people as being naturals and having it in them, we need to focus on that's great that you have learned that much. Let's figure out what to learn next and how to go about it. Or, you know, what are the questions that you have? What do you want to learn about next, right? And for us to model that behavior as well. Um, so um, there's another research study that was done in companies uh, where employees of, Sir, of Fortune 500 companies were asked similar questions to the ones that I uh, described earlier, but about their company, like for example, when it comes to being successful, this company seems to believe that people have a certain amount of talent and they can't really do much to change it. You either have the talent or you don't have the talent. And people would agree or disagree with that. And so the first, uh, the first conclusion of this study was that employees tended to know whether they, they tended to be on the same page as to whether their company was a growth mindset organization or a fixed mindset organization. About 85% agreement, so employees knew they had the different perspective of their organization. So that was the first uh, surprising thing. The, the second thing is that employees in growth mindset organizations trusted their company more, they, they had a greater sense of ownership over their work. They were more committed and willing to, willing to go the extra mile for their company. Uh, they also said that their company supported more risk-taking, creativity, and innovation. And they also experienced the work environment as being more ethical. Because when people think that you either have it or you don't, people tend to cut corners and try to do things in an unethical way because they don't have another way to try to go about it. Uh, and in these same companies, also when you ask supervisors about their employees, they, they rated their employees as being more innovative, as being more collaborative, uh, being more committed to learning and growing, and having far more management potential. So in organizations that were perceived as developing people rather than trying to select people, uh, there were all these benefits about risk-taking, creativity, and innovation. So, um, we see that a growth mindset has a lot of benefit, and we see people who uh, were wearing a growth mindset a lot of the time, like Albert Einstein, Warren Buffett, and, and Laszlo Polgar. Um, now, is it true? Is it true that people can develop their abilities like these people believed, right? And it turns out that wherever we look, we find evidence for this, despite our fixed mindsets. So, there's been, I want to share a couple of research studies around this question. One large area of research was led by a person by the name of Anders Ericsson. He's a professor at Florida State. And what he did is he studied uh, domains that were objectively measurable, where expertise could be measured objectively. Because, for example, in business leadership, it's hard to measure that objectively because how good we are as leaders depends on, a lot on luck you know, the company we're working for, the relationships that our parents have, you know, all kinds of things that are just hard to measure. But in domains like chess or like classical music or ballet, uh, we can study that more objectively, draw conclusions, and then figure out how does this apply to business leadership, right? So he looked at the top performers in the world in these domains that where, uh, where performance was objectively measured, and he found that 
there was nothing in their childhood that could have predicted their extraordinary performance. Like IQ was not a predictor, for example. What they did find matters is something that they called deliberate practice, which is not how much you practice, it's not just how much you practice, it's the quality of practice. And we'll talk about what characteristics that has. Uh, so the more that people practice effectively, the better that they became. And they didn't find any top experts who hadn't done a lot of deliberate practice for at least nine years. So everybody they studied had done a lot of practice to develop their expertise over time. And the second thing that they found was different between these top experts and others was that they slept more. These people who, who achieved greatest expertise slept more than other people. And the reason is that deliberate practice involves thinking hard, it involves full concentration. You can't multitask when you're doing deliberate practice. You have to really focus on something that's really hard. And so the brain becomes tired and it needs more rest. And second, when we sleep, we actually learn. Our brain is making new connections, it's disconnecting connections that shouldn't be there, it's removing toxins so that we can think more clearly the next day. And so these people who, who become best in their field actually sleep more, more than other people. Um, there's also been a lot of research in more recent years that has enabled us to look into the brain with brain imaging, right? And we have learned that a thought, when we think, what happens in our brain is that there's a network of neurons firing together. And when a certain number of neurons fire together, we have a particular thought. And we have also learned that we can change our networks. We can connect neurons and disconnect ne neurons which enables us to think differently and to become smarter. So for example, there was a study done with London taxi drivers. To become a taxi driver in London, you have to study and learn all 25,000 streets in London. And in London, it's not a grid, like it's a big mess. You have to learn where all these 25,000 streets are. And you have to pass a test that is very challenging, that is like, if you want to go from this church to this school, what's the best way to go? And you have to figure this out from your, from your head without looking at anything. And it has to be the most effective route from one place to the other. So if you look at the brains of people before they have studied for this test, the brain looks like, like the brains of anybody else. But after they have passed this test, their hippocampus is actually physically bigger than the brains of other people. And the hippocampus is involved in memory retrieval and in spatial thinking. So these people, as they're working hard to learn these street names, they're physically changing their brain and functionally changing their brain, making it stronger. And similarly, when we look at the brains of animals, uh, the animals that are in boring environments without other animals and without odors or toys, they, they, they are less dense and they weigh less than the animals who are in stimulating environments with other animals and with toys and odors. So their brains are making more connections because they're thinking more and they're becoming smarter. Um, so how is it that when people are in a growth mindset, they experience all these benefits? I, I wanna share a couple of research studies around that that tell us how is it that all of this happens? Because it turns out that when we are in a growth mindset, our brain has different goals than we're in a fixed mindset. We perceive things differently, we pay attention to different things, and we react in different things. And I want to summarize that for you. But to give you an example, so I'm gonna give you a specific study as an example, and then I'm gonna summarize a lot of other studies. But in this particular study, uh, they had people work on challenging problems inside of a functional MRI machine. But before, before this, they, they assessed their mindset. They gave them a survey like the ones that I described to see if these people thought intelligence could be developed or intelligence was fixed in people. And then they had these people work on challenging problems while they were looking at their brains. And what they found is that the people who thought that intelligence could be developed, they paid attention to what they did wrong in the problem. They said they paid attention to the mistake that they made and what they could learn from that and how they could do things differently next time. That's when their brain was, be, was acting, was, was reacting more. There was more blood flow, more electricity, when there was information about what they did wrong. Versus if they thought that, that intelligence was fixed, the brain wasn't doing much 
when the mistake was in front of them. What actually they were most interested in is on whether they got the problem right or wrong. Did it, what was my score? Did I get this right or wrong? It's as if they were just trying to figure out how good they were rather than try to figure out how to learn. And also as a result of this, the people who thought that intelligence could be developed then learn from their mistakes and achieve more accuracy in the future problems. So they, their brain was paying attention to what they can learn as opposed to how good they are. Um, so that's just an example study. But to summarize lots of other studies on how this different belief leads us to behave differently, whether internally or externally. Um, uh, here's, here's a table to describe that. So first of all, people in a fixed mindset see the world as comprised of either people who are talented or not talented. They want to be in the talented category. And the most in, the, what they want to do is to prove how talented they are. And so what they tend to do is they keep doing the things that they already know how to do effortlessly, quickly, without mistakes, and they keep doing that over and over again. They get feedback on how good they are if they keep doing the same thing over and over again. Versus people in a growth mindset, they become bored if they're doing the same thing and they don't, they're never challenging themselves and growing themselves. So if we're not challenging people and they want to, to learn, they can become bored and unmotivated and they can leave our companies, right? So second, people in a fixed mindset view effort as something that's negative. Only people who have low ability need to put effort into things. People who have a high ability don't need to put effort into things. So when, they're, when they have the need to work hard, it makes them feel bad about themselves and they want to keep doing the things where they don't have to put effort into things. Versus people in a growth mindset, they understand that we all benefit from effort and the best people work really hard to get there and continue to work really hard to get even better. So they see effort as something that's positive, that makes us smarter. People in a fixed mindset avoid challenges versus seeking challenges. Uh, when there's change, and we talked about how much change there is in today's world, that change is represented in the brain as a threat. It's a different network of neurons firing if people are in a fixed mindset versus an, as an opportunity. Um, when, when we experience setbacks like mistakes or experience failure, people in a fixed mindset tend to Think, think, tend to take that as evidence that they don't have the ability, so they tend to feel helpless and disengaged, versus people in a growth mindset understand that mistakes and setbacks are part of the learning process. If we're challenging ourselves with something we haven't mastered yet, of course we're going to make mistakes and we're going to learn from those mistakes. Um, when people receive feedback or criticism, people in a fixed mindset take that as a, as a personal attack, so therefore they they react defensively. They say, this person doesn't know what they're talking about, or you know, this person's just trying to hurt me. Versus in a growth mindset, we listen. We say, is there something that is being said that I could learn from? Is there some truth here that I could benefit from? Um, when other people succeed, people in a fixed mindset see that as a threat versus as an inspiration or a source of learning. Um, when there's wrongdoing in the office, like for example, when there's foul politics, um, People in a fixed mindset who think that people's qualities are fixed, they attribute that wrongdoing to fixed traits in the other person versus something that is, is a function of their current motivations right, or, or situation, both of which can change. And so as a result of that, people in a fixed mindset tend to engage in warfare and retaliation, trying to beat the other person down, as opposed to talk to the other person, negotiate, and find a common ground. And finally, when life gets really hard, uh, we see higher rates of depression for people in a fixed mindset versus greater resilience for people in a growth mindset. Now, as we were going through these, um, did anybody kind of think about anybody in your lives, personally or work, who fit, fit either column? Uh, is there anybody who thought, oh, you know, I can see this person, whether myself or somebody else, who kind of fit this column or that column? Hmm. Okay. All right. Great. So we. So yes. So let's spend a little bit more time thinking about that. Okay. Um, and and with the understanding that we can be in a growth mindset about certain things and in a fixed mindset about other things. Like for example, we can be in a growth mindset about learning a new language, thinking that we can learn new languages, and a fixed mindset about being creative. Right. I'm just not a creative person, and our mindsets can also change. So for example, if we go to a design thinking workshop, we might then say, oh, I can learn how to be creative. 
and that can put us into a growth mindset of creativity. And for us as business leaders, the question is, how can we design our organizations so that people are in a growth mindset and they are thinking that they can get better and engaging in the, be in the behaviors to get better? And we'll explore that more. So we can have different mindsets about any ability, prioritizing, being socially engaging, using technology, right? Is that something that is only for millennials or not? Uh, managing people, playing a particular sport, managing the complexity in life. Is, is, is our ability to manage our email fixed, or can we get better at that, right? So uh, let's, let's think a little bit. When have I seen someone else in a fixed mindset, and how did that affect them and others? I want your ideas on this. Is there a time when you saw somebody else who was in a fixed mindset, and how did they behave, and how did it affect other people? Negativity, low self-esteem, defensive, D restricted growth, retaliation, demotivated, limited, frustration. <coughs> Less productive, static, Repulsive, stressful, stressful. If there, we feel that we can't change our situation and we can't change ourselves and we can't help other people evolve, that's very, very stressful. Rigid, angry, affected the development of the department, low listening, low morale. Thank you. Now, so when we talk about growth mindsets and fixed mindsets, sometimes there's the tendency of thinking, okay, well, we just won't allow a fixed mindset in our organization. We'll just all have a growth mindset. And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way because fixed mindsets are part of being human. We all experience fixed mindsets some of the time, and we all tend to have more of a fixed mindset about certain things and more of a growth mindset about other things, and our mindsets fluctuate. So an important part of this work is to increase our own self-awareness and to reflect on what things do I tend to be in a fixed mindset about, right? And that increased understanding of ourselves helps us better understand mindsets and better understand ourselves and therefore be able to change. Um, so um, we need to recognize our fixed mindsets. That's a, a step number one in order to foster growth mindsets. And before like, trying to change others, we need to do some reflection on ourselves and start change within ourselves. So we're going to do an exercise right now where I'll ask you to share with a partner, with a neighbor that you're sitting next to, um, when you have been in a fixed mindset and how it affected you. What, what was the situation when you were in a fixed mindset? And at first, I'll share for me, when I was growing up, I, um, when I was in elementary school and middle school and high school, I had a very, I didn't know it at the time, but I had a very fixed mindset about social skills. So I thought that some other peers, other kids, they were really good at talking to other people, at making them laugh, at saying clever things, and other people were very awkward, and I felt very awkward. I, I never could think of anything to say uh, that would make people laugh or, you know, making friends or anything like that. Um, and so when I was speaking with anybody, I would get really nervous, my hands would start sweating, my heart would start palpitating, and I couldn't think of anything to say. And I would have loved to just become invisible and not need to talk to anybody. And it wasn't until I became an adult and I was talking to my friend Mike, who is really good with people, he's really funny, he's really sociable, and one day he said, you know, Eduardo, that thing that I just did, it didn't work at all. Next time I'm going to try X. And that was a big aha moment for me because I realized, wow, Mike is so funny and so good at talking to people because his whole life he's been experimenting with what to do and reflecting on it and trying different things. And I've never done that before. It never even crossed my mind that social skills was something that people could develop. So I realized how my mindset was getting in the way for myself. 
Um, and from that day on, I realized, okay, I'm going to observe Mike, what he does. I'm going to emulate that. I'm going to experiment myself with what works, what doesn't work. I'm going to put myself out of the comfort zone. And as a result of that, I have grown a lot since. I have a long way to go. I always will in any ability. But I've become a lot better because I realized I can get better, which is something that I didn't know before. So now it's your turn. Let's take a couple of minutes for you to share with a partner. When have I been in a fixed mindset, and how has that affected me, and perhaps how has that affected other people? Let's take two minutes to share. Give me a uh, cup of water, please. Thanks. Just a, a bottle of water would be great. Thank you. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. All right, let's bring it back. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thanks for engaging in these conversations. They help us better understand ourselves and better understand mindsets. And that empowers us to be able to influence mindset over time. Um, it also, I encourage you to have these conversations at work or with your loved ones and have fixed mindsets be something that we can talk about rather than something that is taboo because that way we can support one another better and we can share our challenges, our thinking challenges with one another. Uh, over time. Now, one of, the, one of the goals of this session that I mentioned is to generate new insights about ourselves and about other people. Those insights, any insight is a weak connection in the brain because it's a new connection in the brain. And if we don't pay attention to it and try to reinforce it, we tend to lose those insights. So let's spend a couple of minutes trying to figure out, are there any new insights that I have gained so far in what we have explored? Uh, and what are those insights? So has there anybody here who has like, gained any new insights so far in our session? Anybody with new insight? Great. So we have some people. Great. Great. Let's try to pay attention to any new insights. And let's share that with one another so we can learn from one another. What is an insight I have gained so far, either about myself, about other people, or about humans? What is an insight that I have gained so far? I would love your ideas. Importance of keeping growing. Being reflective. Being open to change. Coming out of inhibition. Sleeping increases intelligence. We can learn to be in a growth mindset. Growth mindset or fixed mindsets are not fixed in us, but we can actually have the ability to become more growth minded. If he can do it, so can I. Absolutely. You have a few more thoughts. The impact when others have a fixed mindset. The importance of adapting to change. Being open to change. Now, I want to, um, I want to point something out that is that being open to change is important, right? And uh, being reflective is important. Uh, those are behaviors that are a lot easier to do if we are in a growth mindset. And a growth mindset means viewing qualities and abilities as malleable. So yes, focusing on the behaviors is good, but let's also think about, do I have the underlying belief about the abilities and qualities as malleable, as things that can improve? And that specific definition of a growth mindset is important. Sometimes we just focus on the behaviors, and we keep fixed mindset thinking of seeing abilities as fixed, and that doesn't work.
Great. So thank you for sharing your insights. Clarity of thought, excellent. Um, so I talked about, I shared research showing how a growth mindset leads to more learning and growth, and therefore higher performance. I also, I'm not going to go into other research studies, but I want to share a couple of uh, insights from other research on the benefits of a growth mindset. So we saw research that showed that people in a growth mindset grow faster and improve more. They also perform higher, and they're also more resilient. So when there's change, when there's struggle, when things are hard, they stick at it more. But also, in a growth mindset, there's greater creativity and innovation. We've seen that in research with individuals and with organizations. People are more willing to take risks, to try new things, to, to share crazy ideas with one another. And there's also, in a growth mindset, there's also more diversity, as I will mention. And that diversity also leads to greater creativity and innovation. Also, in growth mindset environments, we see that there's more positive and collaborative relationships. We talked about the, the reaction to wrongdoing, like foul politics. People talk more, negotiate more, learn from one another more, and find common ground more. They influence each other more. And that leads to more positive and collaborative relationships. We see more ethical behavior in growth-minded environments, and we also see greater diversity and equity. So the impact of negative stereotypes is decreased when we think that people are not fixed the way they are. Because the negative stereotypes, unfortunately, are there. You know, they are unconscious. We don't mean to have these negative stereotypes. But the impact of those stereotypes on both the stereotype person and others is, is less if we think that abilities and qualities are malleable. And so we see greater diversity and equity in these environments. And we also see that employees trust their organization more, and they, they feel greater commitment and sense of ownership over their organizations. So those are some of the other benefits of a growth mindset environment that we see from the research. Um, so for us, what's a growth mindset? A growth mindset is the belief that we can improve in anything that we're interested in. Here are some examples in the workplace, in our work, and here are some examples in our personal life. And we can think about any of these things in a growth-minded way as things that we can improve or in a fixed mindset way as things that we either have or we don't have. And that belief leads us to behave differently. Same thing with the people we lead, right? And so for us as business, le business leaders, we need to reflect on what can we do as business leaders, A, for ourselves to be more in a growth mindset and for everybody that we lead to be in a growth mindset, and we'll explore that. Um, so um, let's reflect, let's take a minute to just brainstorm questions, okay? For the rest of our time together, what questions do you have about growth mindset that you're hoping that I cover and that we discuss? What questions do I have so far? Any questions? Can you write them down here? We're just gonna, we're just gonna populate them here in the screen. How, how do we do this? How do we transform? How do we kick, kick start it? How can I improve decision making? So that's a particular ability I want to improve. How do I go about it? How do I become better at decision making? How do I adopt to change faster? How can we break stereotypes? How can we manage conflicts? So these are all abilities that we say, okay, like if we can get better at these abilities, how do we do it? How do we become better at these things? How much do genes, environment, influence mindset or intelligence? How to move from fixed mindset to growth mindset? Great. So let me address one question here, and then the rest of it we'll, 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 um, we'll address in, uh, in the rest of the session. So how much do genes, environments, influence mindset and intelligence? Um, so genes and the environment, nature and nurture, both are, both have a presence, right? Where, wherever we are today is partly a result of genes, right? And partly a result of the environment that we're in. Uh, now, it's really hard to tell what percentage comes from which is, you know, people have been trying to figure that out for, for hundreds of years. Um, but first of all, our cognitive ability is incredibly developed. We saw that in the Polgar, uh, in the Polgar experiment that people can learn to think in incredible ways. So it's a lot more n developed than we tend to think. 
And then second, in a growth mindset, what matters is that we can improve. You know, how much of it is, is nature versus nurture doesn't matter very much. What we can focus on is that everybody can improve and get better, which is a fact. Uh, and if we focus on improvement and getting better, then we take on the growth-minded behaviors and we grow more and we succeed more. Um, so let's, let's move into what can we do, right? What, as business leaders, what can we do to foster a growth mindset in ourselves? in our organizations, and to become better at whatever we want to get better at, whether it's decision making, or managing conflict, or any of the other questions that you have, right? So um, we've already been working on this, what we can do as leaders, because it's important to understand mindsets, to figure out what they are. If we don't understand them, it's hard to act upon them. We've also been observing our fixed mindsets in particular and how that affects us. That increased self-awareness is critical in order for us to take action. And we've also learned a little bit about the science of improvement. If a growth mindset is about understanding that we can get better, then learning the science behind that helps us get into a growth mindset, right? So let's continue to build on this. So as leaders, Leaders can depict a vision of learning. What's the culture that you want in your organization? Do you want the senior people to be knowers and to have all the answers? Or you, do you want them to continue to learn and develop themselves? What do you want everybody in your organization to be doing? And how do you communicate what's important to you, what your core values are, so that people have a vivid vision of the future about what kind of interactions you want and what you want people to be doing? Second, second, you can create that culture and those structures for growth. So if people say, okay, I can become better at managing conflict, but how do I do it? You know, they need actually structures to figure out how to get better and take action, not just the belief that they can get better. And third, we can model being learners as leaders. So we'll explore all those things. And to go into this, I'm going to share an analogy with a group of people who are very, very high performers, and that is Cirque du Soleil. So I love watching Cirque du Soleil. Has anybody watched Cirque du Soleil before? A few people, great. So they, are, they do these amazing acrobatic things, and they do them beautifully and artistically. And one thing that strikes me when I watch Cirque du Soleil perform is that they rarely make mistakes, if ever. They do everything flawlessly, and they don't make any mistakes. And I find that inspiring, but that's a little bit inconsistent with a growth mindset philosophy because in a growth mindset philosophy, we want to be challenging ourselves, making mistakes, and learning from those mistakes. So how do I reconcile that I, I think very highly of this high-performing group, and yet they very rarely make mistakes, right? And what we sometimes don't realize is that the reason that Cirque du Soleil is so good at what they do is that they spend a lot of time doing something completely different, which is at their studio and at the gym, they're working on the things that they haven't mastered yet. So if we, if we observe them practicing, they're gonna be dropping the ball a lot and missing the timing you know, and making a lot of mistakes because they're working on what they haven't mastered yet. They're working on, what, on the next thing, right? The next level of, of mastery. Um, and those are very, very different spaces. When they're in front of us, they're focused on what they know. When they're practicing to get better, they're focusing on what they don't know. Same thing in sports, right? If somebody is playing a championship final and they're having trouble with a particular move, they're gonna try to avoid that move in that championship final. But when they go back to their coach, they're gonna say, coach, I'm having trouble with that particular thing, let's work on that. And those are very, very, very different things. Um, and so what research shows is that the more people spend, the more time they spend on the left focused on improvement, the better they become and the better they can perform on the right. And what often happens in the workplace or in the rest of our lives is that we spend all of our time on the right, performing, trying to do things flawlessly without mistakes, and what that leads to is stagnation. So we need to reflect on what does it, lead to, what, what does it take to improve and how can we be deliberate at, as, at improvement because hard work alone doesn't lead to improvement. We have to actually take on improvement-oriented behaviors in order to get better. So Roger Federer, who's one of the best tennis players of all time, was once being interviewed by a reporter, and he said, December was crucial. I don't want to say this in a cocky way, but I believe I worked the hardest from the top eight players in the offseason. Many guys went off to play exhibitions or were in the Davis Cup. I, so they, many people were on the right, performing, playing games, playing tournaments. I had time. I put my head down and worked. 
I was on the left, focused on improvement, and that was very important to me. So he's very clear about these two zones. And what the best performers do is they alternate between these two zones, right? They perform, but then like Cirque du Soleil, they go back behind curtains to focus on improvement, and they go in this cycle, right? Uh, Cirque du Soleil, uh, the staff of Cirque du Soleil arrives each day to work at 12 p.m. noon, and they spend about four to six hours working on the learning zone every day before the performance where they go into the performance zone, as an example. Uh, so let's unpack this a little bit more. Uh, so in the learning zone, our goal is to improve versus in the performance zone, our goal is to perform. The activities are designed differently, and we're going to unpack that a little bit more. In the learning zone, we focus on what we don't know, what we haven't mastered yet, versus on what we have already mastered and can do flawlessly. And very important is that in the learning zone, if we are focused on what we haven't mastered yet, of course we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to learn from those mistakes. That's very important. Versus in the performance zone, we're trying to minimize mistakes and to avoid mistakes. Very, very different. The source, we, we, the source of mistakes is differently. In the learning zone, we're making mistakes because we're challenging ourselves with things that are difficult. In the performance zone, sometimes we make mistakes, and sometimes Cirque du Soleil makes mistakes on stage. And the source of those mistakes, when we reflect on it and say, why did that mistake happen? It's often the source difference. So it's like we lost focus, or we, we, did, not become, we did not remain concentrated, or we weren't as prepared as we thought. But there's, in, in, whenever we make a mistake, the, the great response to the mistake is to think about, why did that happen? What can I learn from it? So a learning-oriented response to mistake, and a growth mindset is beneficial in both the learning zone and the performance zone. So I want to focus on this idea that in the learning zone, mistakes are to be expected. If we're asking people, if you're saying, this time and space is for you to improve, so I want, to be focused on, I want you to focus on things you haven't mastered yet, you're not going to do them flawlessly, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to learn from those mistakes, then if that's true, then in that time and space, the consequence of making mistakes must not be very consequential. You know, they must not be punished if they make mistakes, because otherwise they're going to just be in a performance zone trying to avoid mistakes. Like, for example, um, if we have a tightrope walker in Cirque du Soleil, they're not going to try to learn new tricks unless there's a net underneath, because they know they're going to fall and they're going to die, right, if there's not a net, net underneath them. So they need to be in a safe place in order to challenge themselves because they know that they're going to be learning, making mistakes. And sometimes in our workplaces can feel like this, right? Like if we make a mistake, other people will think less of us, right? And, and so we, we create this high stakes zone, this unsafe zone, just because, because of our social interactions. Because we think if I struggle, if I make a mistake, other people will think less of, it, of me. And if that's true, then that's going to put people in a performance zone all the time. And then that's not going to lead to improvement for the individuals or for the organization. So a question for us leaders is, how do we create a social environment at work where people have a time and space to challenge themselves, experiment, make mistakes, talk about what they could do better, and have that be something that people look up to and it's encouraged, rather than something that makes people feel less uh, less capable, right? Um, so also, to, to unpack this idea that the activities are designed differently in the learning zone or the performance zone, let me point out that for chess players, for the serious chess players, the more time that they spend playing games of chess, the lower their ranking. So the more, the more hard work that they put into playing games of chess, the worse they become as chess players. And the reason is that playing a game of chess is a performance activity, not a learning activity. They're trying to minimize mistakes. They're just trying to do things as best as they can. In chess, what leads to improvement are activities like, for example, taking a chess position that happened between a game between grandmasters and trying to figure out what move would I make then trying to figure out what move did the grandmaster make, and try to figure out why did they make that move instead of this one. And you might try to solve that. It might take you like 30 minutes to figure out why they make that move and not this one. And that's very different than playing a game of chess. Or for us, 
you know, we can think about typing. You know, how many hours have we spent typing in our computer or our phones for the last like four years or 10 years? And for most of us, we probably feel that at the beginning we got better and then we stagnated. Even though we're putting a lot of hours into typing, we're not getting better. And the reason is that we try to minimize mistakes, we just execute, right? We're just trying as best as we can. Uh, versus the typists in training, the typists who become you know, twice as fast or three times as fast as we, as we do, and every, any, any of us could do that, they do something very differently. They spend 10 to 20 minutes each day fully concentrated on trying to type 10 to 20% faster than their current reliable speed. So they're making a lot of mistakes, challenging themselves, fully concentrated, trying to type faster than they can. And they do that for 10 to 20 minutes each day. And then they look at what, the, what mistakes they made. And then the next day, they practice with words rich in those words that led them to make mistakes. So the words that are most challenging for them, those are the texts that they are using to try to improve. And that activity is very different than a performance zone activity. So it's just not hard work and time on task that leads to improvement. That, that does work early on when we are novices and we don't know how to do anything. Like, you know, we don't, we're so bad that any time on task will help us get better. But in order to get past proficiency, we have to be deliberate about improvement. Uh, so if we type as usual, we don't see improvement. If we do deliberate practice, we do see improvement. And so Anders Ericsson saw this, and they, they realized that in order for people to improve, they need to engage in what they call deliberate practice. And what, what that was was, first of all, when people were clear on what they wanted to get better at. So it wasn't like, I want to become a better leader. That's just too vague. It was the sub-skill that these people were identifying. Like, for example, I want to more clearly more clearly paint a vision of the future, or I want to develop more rapport with, with, uh, with the person that I'm leading, or I want to be a better public speaker and look people in the eye. It was something very specific that people were clear on. What do I want to improve on? Uh, second, it was highly demanding mentally. So it's not like these people were multitasking when they were trying to improve. They were fully concentrated on something that was beyond what they could currently do. Uh, it involved feedback monitoring, repetition, and adjustments. So repetition, say, trying something, seeing how well it worked, uh, reflecting on it, trying it again, or trying something else, and kind of a, a, repetitive, um, a, a repetitive cycle. And finally, it ideally involved guidance from a skilled coach or somebody who could provide useful feedback and guidance. And uh, so these, this type of practice is very different than just you know, practicing, for example, in the guitar, trying to play a song over and over again is very different than trying to play the scales or a particular piece of a song. Um, and so uh, how does this relate in the workplace? Uh, there was a, a team of researchers at Harvard University who looked at research studies that had looked into how much do general physicians, do doctors, improve over time over their careers? You know, the more years of experience that they have, how much better do they become? And what they found is that there were two studies that showed that the more years of experience for general physicians, the better that they become. There were 15 studies that showed no correlation between experience and expertise. And there were 45 studies that showed that the more years of experience for general physicians, the worse that they became. So the more time and years that they had on the job, the worse that they became. Now, in most professions, what we see is that the more experienced, people get better at the beginning, and then they stagnate. And that's the research that we see in most professions. With general physicians, they actually get worse on average, not everybody. Because first of all, they forget information that is relevant to infrequent diagnosis. So things that they learned in school, they remember it in the early years, but then they forget it if they're not seeing it as part of their job. And second, uh, they, they don't keep up with new technologies and new techniques, so they become actually worse because they're not keeping up with change and new techniques and technologies. So for us and for our organizations and the people that, that we lead, could it be like this? Could it be that we're actually not getting better over time and we're stagnating, right? So I want you to think about it, your company, to what extent are people deliberate about improvement? For example, to what extent do people set learning goals? 
Is every person in the organization clear on what they want to get better at? Is every department or team or group clear on what they want to get better at? It's really hard to get better at things if we don't even know what we're trying to get better at, right? Um, are people researching better strategies, you know, doing online research or watching videos or, or t reading books, taking courses? Are people experimenting and trying new things and seeing how those things work? Asking questions to which we don't know the answer versus feeling that we need to have all the answers and be knowers. Are people asking questions on what they want to learn about? Consulting with colleagues and domain experts. Observing advanced performers, whether companies or people, emulating them, comparing what we're doing to what they're doing. Reflecting and assessing how things went, whether good or bad, and what we could do differently next time. Examining mistakes, not just brushing them under the car carpet, not just saying mistakes are okay, but saying, okay, we made a mistake, let's think about it. What can we learn from it? What can we do differently next time? Let's actually use mistakes to learn from them. Soliciting, giving, and receiving feedback. Is feedback something that's happening all the time? Speaking with each other about how to improve, about how we're doing all of these things and other things. How are we getting better? And how can we get better at getting better? So what are some of the things that your organizations are doing well in this list? And what are some things that your organization could get better at, right? So let's uh, take a little poll. At my company, to what extent do we engage in learning zone activities? Let's take a poll, a temperature on, on the room. Uh, let's, let's have you answer this question. Okay, great. So, I mean, most of you feel that you could significantly improve in your use of learning zone activities. I hope that this has given you some food for thought in terms of what that, what that means and what that entails, and we'll keep exploring it. Um, I want to also point out that um, the, the, the last choice, choice D, is that I don't think learning zone activities would be useful for us. There's less than 3% of you who feel that learning zone activities are not useful. And if you do this same poll in your organizations, you will see, the same, you will see similar results. And what that says is that 97% of people, or more, 98, 99%, here 96%, um, feel that learning zone activities are something people want. You, people want these types of activities. And so if you start this conversation within your organizations, you're going to find that people are going to gravitate toward it and are going to engage in it. Because you know, whether we think we're doing it well or not right now, 97% you know, of people are valuing these types of activities and are going to embrace them. Um, so um, I want to reflect a little bit on how you as leaders affect other people. Because your teams, the people that you lead, as well as your peers and other people, are observing you closely. And they're learning from your behavior. They're learning from what you do. They're learning from what you say. And they're learning from what you think, because what you think affects what you do and what you say. And from all of that, they're learning whether you think that abilities are malleable or fixed. They're learning whether growing our abilities is important in our organization. And they're learning how we go about improvement. What is it that we do in order to improve in this company? So we need to reflect on what messages are we sending as leaders through our words and our actions. Um, and we need to make our learning visible to other people. Sometimes we feel like we need to be like Cirque du Soleil and only try to learn behind curtains. And when we come to work, then appear like we are all knowers and we are flawless. 
but then people see us as knowers rather than learners, and then they emulate that. So they act like knowers as well, uh, versus trying to do these things that we talked about visibly as leaders and saying, this is something that we want everybody to be doing here, and I'm going to be you know, the chief learner here. I, I want you to observe me and do as I do, not, not just as I say. Um, so one thing that we can do is avoid labeling people in fixed ways, like talking about A players and C players in fixed ways, right? Or who is a genius or a natural leader. All of these things communicate fixed mindset views of the nature of these abilities. And we also, um, we also shouldn't portray ourselves as flawless or as all-knowing, because then people learn, okay, what, what determines high status in this organization is knowing everything and not continuing to improve ourselves. So that's then what people emulate, right? And instead, what we can do is talk about the behaviors that people can do. What, not what they are in fixed ways, but what can they do to improve and to get better? The strategies that they're using, the cho choices that they're making. We can praise the challenges that they're taking, right? Taking risks and experimenting and doing the behaviors that we talked about, like soliciting feedback and acting on that feedback, valuing mistakes and discussing them, and thinking about people's progress and growth over time rather than comparing people to each other, right? Let's focus on people's growth rather than, you know, you are better than this person at this. You know, let's, that's, that's okay to, to observe at any one point in time. But, like, let's think about you have gotten to this point, and now we need to continue growing, right? So comparing a person to the same person, not to other people. And portraying ourselves as learners, as risk takers, as experimenters, as people who solicit feedback and who are working to improve ourselves. Um, so uh, let's think, as I go through these um, behaviors, I want you to think about what are you currently doing visibly in front of other people, and what could you get better at? So are you identifying skills that you want to improve and sharing them with others? Are you taking on worthwhile challenges or risks that you can learn from, things that are going to make you struggle? Are you seeking resources for your improvement, experimenting, asking questions rather than having all the answers, answering, I don't know, what do you think, or let's figure this out together, soliciting feedback, and recognizing your own mistakes and what you're learning from those mistakes. Are you doing these things as a leader so that other people behave in the same way, or are you trying to portray yourself as flawless? So I'd love for you to think about, is there one or two things here that you would like to do more of? And make a note of that. So let's share our reflections. What could I do more of to better model being a learner? And when could I do that and with whom? What could I do more of to better model being a learner in my organization? Introspect. Reflection is so important. Reflection on how we're doing, what's working well, what's not working well, what to do differently next time. Admitting mistakes rather than brush them under the carpet. Seeing mistakes as opportunities to model learning. Listening to others. Spend more time with myself, reflecting. Sharing with my peers how I learn and what I'm learning. Asking for help. Creating a culture of help seeking in our organizations. Training together with the team. Rather than having them be attend trainings, let me train with them and learn with them. Being more, having more positivity. Being more aware of performance versus improvement behaviors. Being motivated to learn. Great, thank you. Admitting mistakes. So in addition to modeling being learners as leaders, 
we can also reflect on what structures do we need in place in our companies to facilitate improvement. You know, some of the questions that you had was where, for example, okay, I want to get better at conflict resolution. How do I get better at conflict resolution? There's people in your organizations who are wondering the same thing. So are there structures and resources in place for those people to learn how to become better at conflict resolution or at any other skill that people are interested in learning about, right? And so are we, first of all, identifying improvement as important in our organizations? Is this important here? Is it part of our DNA? Is it a core value? Are people hearing that from their leaders, right? Um, are we identifying how to improve? If people want to get better at something, are we guiding them on resources and how they can go about it? Do people know how to seek and give feedback and receive feedback? Sometimes people are really scared of asking for feedback, giving, pe giving feedback and receiving feedback, and there's a lot of knowledge about how to go about it. And when, when people learn how to do it, then they can engage in it a lot more effectively. Um, in team meetings, are we reflecting on what's going well and what's not going well and what we could do better next time or what mistakes we've made recently and what we can learn from those mistakes? Is that something that we're regularly talking about in our meetings? What are we rewarding socially or in our promotions or bonuses? Is it perfection and flawlessness or are we also rewarding risk taking and lessons learned and sharing lessons learned with other people and growth? Do we create spaces for risk taking? It's okay to say, in this particular area of our work, we don't want to take risks. But are there spaces where we are encouraging people to take risks and to work to improve themselves? Learning zone versus performance zone. And are we modeling being learners as leaders? All of these things, they communicate what you deem important as a leader, and they support or don't support learning. So as an example of that is experimentation, right? So in, in fixed mindset organizations, uh, over time, performance just it, it plateaus. There's, there's no improvement because everything is, nothing is changing, right? The same thing that we did yesterday is what we're doing today. So our performance just stays flat. Uh, in a growth mindset organization, one example of how organizations can improve is by doing experiments. So for example, we can say, okay, let's figure out if this particular thing would work better than what we have been doing in the past. Now, it could work better, it could increase our performance, or it could work, work worse. It could decrease our performance, because we don't know, we haven't tried it before. If it works worse, we won't do that anymore, but if it works better, then we'll adopt that as one of our practices. And so, through experimenting, we increase our performance over time. We learn as an organization, right? Because uh, we stop doing the things that don't work, and we embrace the things that we do work. And, and it's important to, to note that we should be seeing growth and improvement over time, whether in a person or in a team or in the whole company. In a growth mindset, what the research shows is that people grow more and perform higher in a growth mindset. So if we're not seeing that growth and improvement, we have to figure out why is that and what can we change so that we do see that growth and improvement, right? Uh, so that real improvement is necessary. So let's reflect on what could we do at my company to further cultivate a growth mindset and continuous improvement culture? What is one thing that you as business leaders could do in your company to make them more improvement oriented? Let's share ideas with each other. Formal learning sessions, job rotation, put people into other roles to learn what other people are doing. That increases empathy as well, right? That we heard is so important. Make learning more interactive. Exposure to experiments. Self-learning groups, so have pe give people more autonomy and teams more autonomy to figure out how to, to try things differently and to see what they can learn um, on their own rather than their manager telling them what to learn, right? And ideally having them share lessons learned with other teams so that we can learn, teams can learn from each other. 
facilitate peer learning. Excellent. Park a fortnight learning session. Expectation setting. Thank you. Great, so a couple of key takeaways from this session. First of all, a growth mindset is not just being open-minded or trying hard or being resilient. A growth mindset is something specific, which is seeing abilities or human qualities as malleable, things that we can improve. And that belief is really important for the learning behaviors to take place. Um, so we need to think about what things do I tend to see as fixed, what things does my team tend to see as fixed, and how do we shift those beliefs. Second, so that belief is really important for the behaviors to take place. Um, second, uh, people emulate you. They're observing you. They're learning from what you say and what you do. And so if you behave as a learner, they will too. But if, if you behave as a knower, as somebody who's flawless, they will do the same as well. So as leaders, you influence by being role models, and actions speak louder than words. And finally, you need to align with your peers, your, the other business leaders and managers in your organization, and think about what philosophies do we have? Are we emphasizing the need to learn and improve over time? Um, are we putting structures for people to learn, to have these conversations? How do we create growth mindset structures in our organization? Uh, a couple of resources to help you in your journeys. Um, well, first, uh, as leaders, you can depict a vision of learning. So is, what do you want your organization to be like and for people to interact? Are you creating this culture and structures for growth? And are you modeling the learning-oriented behaviors? Um, so a couple of resources if you want to expose these ideas to your colleagues uh, back at your organizations. Uh, there's a couple of TED Talks by Carol Dweck. She's my, she has, I've been working with her for 10 years, and she's the one who first discovered growth mindset. She's a Stanford professor. I've done a TED Talk uh, on growth mindset as well as on learning zone versus performance zone. So if you want to expose your colleagues to these ideas, there are those talks. There are also lots of online articles that we've written and other videos. And you, have, uh, you will get some handouts with a list of resources that you can take back uh, and share with your colleagues or with the people that you care about at home. Uh, a couple of great books. One is Mindset by Carol Dweck. And the other one is Peak by Anders Ericsson, the person who experienced, uh, who, who studied how to develop expertise. Um, so uh, I want to close with an observation that was done over 2,500 years ago by a Greek philosopher by the name of Heraclitus, who observed that everything changes and nothing stands still. So he observed that change is always happening. And he observed this 2,500 years ago. And change has never stopped. You know, what's different now is that the pace of change is faster. But change is not going to stop in the future. It never will. But Heraclitus also observed that despite all this change going on around us, our destiny is not a function of what's happening around us, of where the tides might take us. He said character is destiny. Our path and where we go is a function of something that is inside us, not something that is around us. And today we've explored an aspect of character, growth mindset, that helps us set our destiny, that helps us navigate change and leverage change. Now, uh, I want to ask you for a favor, and that is to support my learning zone. I'm going to ask you for, for feedback. And I'm going to ask you two questions. The first question is, how well did this session work for you? Um, and the second question is, what could I do better next time? OK? So here's the first question. How would I rate this session? How, how, how well did this session work for me? I'll give you a few more seconds to finish off. I'm glad that it generally worked for you. Now I'm going to ask you, what could I do better next time? This is how I get better, right? Uh, so what suggestions for improvement 
do you have for me? What could I do better next time? More live examples. Make the pace lower. More examples. Case studies. More demonstrative of the growth mindset. More interaction. Thank you. Specific steps to take. Fewer slides. Include a framework of how to shift to growth mindset. Great. Thank you so much for sharing these ideas. I will review this closely later and learn from it and get better from it. So thank you for sharing your feedback. Uh, role plays, thank you. So I'll close with three questions. The first one is, what did I learn today? Is there anything new that I learned? Second, is there anything I will do about it? How will I lead? How will I lead? And third, who will I become and who will we become in my company? Because in a growth mindset, we never stop becoming. We're always changing ourselves for the rest of our lives. So thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the conference.